Alter is one of the very few Holocaust survivors still living in Portland, if not the United States, if not the world. Uh, as we talked about this morning, there are very few of you left. And uh, so it's a treasure to have you this morning. Um, he shared his life story uh, in the uh, state of Oregon and Washington with over 800 audiences in universities, colleges, schools, churches, synagogues, prisons, companies, and book clubs. Um, he has been interviewed uh, frequently on radio, TV stations, newspapers. Uh, this was interesting to me. He received an honorary bachelor degree from Warner Pacific College, an honorary law degree from Lewis and Clark Law School, received the prestigious Americanism medal um, from the Daughters of the American Revolution, and that was recently from the video that you sent me. Um, and he just uh, wrote in 2007 his autobiography, Reminiscence <coughs> Number, and they'll be available for sale after his talk. Um, this morning for $20 if you have the money. <coughs> so it looks like those books are going to go fast. <laughs> so I, I'm, I'm happy to see that. Um, I'm humbled and I'm honored to have you. Thank you. Very much. And I know the Lord will bless. Uh, Alter comes from a devout Jewish family and uh, he um, is a practicing Jew and his uh, he has a, a wonderful family. His son lives in Seattle. And uh, he has, where's your other son? In, in New York. In New York, yes. And um, one of the interesting things from his book, and I'll just share one thing, and uh, that stood out in my mind and my wife's as she was sharing with me as she finished reading this book just yesterday. She wrote a, see, there's the book review she's going to post on your on, on, on Amazon for you, on Amazon.com, which he requested. But um, he went to Washington County Jail of 70 inmates in the local area here. And after his talk, one inmate told uh, Alter bluntly, I do not believe that there were ovens in Auschwitz and that Germans, burnt, that, that Germans burnt innocent people. It is just an improvised complex put up by the Polish government to make it a tourist attraction. Oh. Totally denied, he was a skinhead, and totally denied that the Holocaust even happened. Um, Alter's living proof that the Holocaust did happen, and that persecution um, did exist and still exists. In fact, they say on the persecution scale, um, it has risen dramatically in other countries, especially the persecution of Christians worldwide. And so um, we need to take note of that. Religious freedom and human rights is slipping away really fast. And uh, I'm worried about it in our own country, as you know. So um, thank you for coming. And uh, let's give him a big <coughs> round of applause and welcome to the <laughs> Good morning, and thank you for being here. Willing to listen to my story. It's not a pleasant story, but it's a very true story. I have no reason to exaggerate. I don't want to impress anybody. I'm just sharing my life. I lived in New York for many years. I didn't talk about it. I realized that most people are not able to comprehend or to believe even. My own children had difficulties. But coming to Oregon in the year 2000, I was approached by the Oregon Holocaust Research Center located in Portland, and they asked me to share my story. I was very hesitant, I have an accent, but I gave it a chance, and my first presentation was at Century High School in Hillsborough. A week later, the teacher gave me about 100 letters from those students. What did they write to me? Mr. Wiener, you changed my life. You saved my life. You made me appreciate my country, my freedom, my, my school. Then I realized that I'm doing something important. And that is, the, I had 56,000 letters so far received. If you read those letters, you'll realize what I'm talking about. Sometimes I'm getting letters that I'm getting emotional because they tell me how much they suffered in their life, their, their difficulties, and in comparison to my difficulties, it's nothing. If you do read my book, 
you don't have to buy it, it's available in all the libraries. You'll see on page 158 a handwritten letter by an eighth grader, and she said in her letter, you saved my life. I intended to kill myself on Thursday, but when I heard your story, I'm not going to kill myself. I just realized that, you that my problems in comparison to youth at my age were so minimal, and she did not kill herself. I know it for a fact because I spoke later on to the teacher and to the counselor, and they told me you saved Nancy's life. And I have at least 100 letters of that nature. It's a very sad phenomena that young children give up when they have to cope with any minor problem and they kill themselves. So this is the main reason that I'm making an effort. It's not easy. I'm 87 years old. It is not easy emotionally. When I talk about it, I see images. It's not easy physically. But I feel a moral obligation to share my story as long as I'm able to. And whatever I say, you can also see if you go to Amazon.com, you'll see what people who heard me or who read my book, how it changed their life. I was not aware of it, that I can make such a positive impact. In other words, it's not a chapter on history. It is a lesson. It is just a lesson. You'll see over there a handwritten letter in my book from a, a, from a middle school student that her mother passed away in ovarian cancer. And she was very close to her mother. And she had suicidal thoughts. But when she heard my story that I lost 123 members of my extended family, my grandparents, my uncles, aunts, cousins, they all murdered. I'm the only survivor of my immediate family. Then she said, oh my God, I'm still lucky. I have a daddy, I have grandparents. You, Mr. Weiner, at my age, lost everybody. So you see, they get a completely different perspective about life. And I am gratified that I make such a difference in their life. When you look at this picture, I know it's hard to believe that it is me. I'm here, 18 years old, or made in 1945 in the Russian army, liberated me. My total weight was 80 pounds, 80 pounds. I could embrace my tie with one hand. So you can imagine what kind of condition I was. In fact, they didn't give me hope to live. They told me if I live another two years, it's going to be a miracle. They made a mistake. They might be dead by now, but I'm here. <laughs> So it is, I know it is hard to believe, but that is exactly how I looked, and I'm sorry. This is exactly how I look. What you see here in the middle of my head, they used to shave us in that Camp Waldenburg to be recognized if one of us contemplated to escape. This is another picture before the war, I mean during the war. I'm here 14 years old. I don't have any pictures from home because they took away from me everything. Later on, and I get to it. But this happened, a neighbor of mine took that picture. I was not aware of it. When I was 14 years old, you can see how despondent I look. I'm wearing the armband with the Star of David. She, that neighbor, she managed to keep that picture during the entire war, and after the war, we met, and she gave me that picture. So this is the only picture that I have before the war. I really cherish it. Let me tell you who I am, where I come from. So you see the star, a little town called Hranów in Poland. As a little kid, I had a very good life according to the lifestyle or standard of living in those days. We didn't have any of the conveniences that you take for granted today. We didn't even have running water. Needless to say, we didn't have an air conditioner, a refrigerator, a car, a television. It didn't exist when I was a little kid. It was a little town of 22,000 people, half Jewish, half Catholics. 
I went to a public school in the morning, to a religious school in the afternoon, six days a week. So I had a pretty good life according to the standard of living in those days. And there are certain values instilled in me as a child that I am very appreciative to older I'm get, the older I get. Just to give you an idea, I had to go to, see, to visit my grandparents every weekend to walk a mile and a half to say hi. They never gave me a toy or a game. They couldn't afford it. It wasn't available. But this was my, my responsibility to show them my love, my respect. Every weekend, rain or shine, I had to go to see my grandparents. On New Year's Eve, I had to knock, to knock at the door of 24 tenants in our building and wish everybody a happy New Year. This was my responsibility. We had a homeless person, sometimes two or three, at our Sabbath table, and we were brought up to respect those homeless people. One thing which is etched in my memory, when those homeless people left, my father gave them a bag with some additional goodies to take home. These things I remember, very etched in my memory. So as I said, I had a pretty good life and all this came to an end on September 1st, 1939, when the German army invaded Poland. And as you see, this little town is very close to the German border. So people try to get away from the border. How do you get away? Nobody in my town had a car. I know for you, Washingtonian or Oregonian, how to imagine how the people survived without a car. The fact is, nobody had a car. And the trains didn't run as they should, so people took personal belongings and walked into the interior of Poland to avoid hoping that the Germans would not succeed to occupy the entire country of Poland, a huge country, 37 million people. And those who could afford, they hired a coachman with a horse thrown wagon and they tried to get away from the border. That's what my father did. He could afford it, he hired somebody. And we did try to get away from the border. When I say we, it was my stepmother. My biological mother died when I was four years old. I do not remember her. My older brother, myself, and my younger brother. My father couldn't join us because the Polish retreating army gave him an order, you stay put because we need the groceries from your business. So he couldn't join us. But we managed to get away about 40 miles. It took a long time because all the roads were clogged with refugees. And eventually, when we arrived to a certain location called Dombrova, which was the hometown of my stepmother, the Germans were there already. So basically, we didn't accomplish anything by our attempt to avoid the Germans. The Polish army was no match to the mighty, mighty German forces. And as you probably know, Poland was occupied within a very few weeks. But we were stuck at that location for three months. They couldn't go back home. There were no means of transportation. Eventually, when we did get back home, we found our apartment looted. And my father, that we left him behind, wasn't there. Any place that we inquired, nobody knew what happened to Mr. Wiener. Then they came to us from the Judenrat, which was a local committee, and they told my stepmother something which I'll never forget. We know that your husband is missing, but we also know that at the outskirts of our town, there's a pit of victims thrown in by the Germans. If you would like to know whether your husband or your father is one of those victims, we are going tomorrow morning to open that pit in order to identify those bodies. What apparently happened, the German picked up at random 38 people in our town, mostly Jews, some Christians, and they shot them. They shot them as an entertainment. It's called the German concept Schadenfreude. They enjoyed watching others suffering. In other words, they shot them they let them bleed until they expired, and then they threw them into a pit. And this happened on September 11, a very infamous day, but this was September 11, 1939. 
So if somebody was shot on September 11 and he tried to identify those bodies three months later, it was very difficult because the bodies were partially decomposed. We didn't have DNA in those days. It was very difficult. Anyway, my stepmother recognized my father's body by the certain items that he had in his clothing that she was familiar with. She collapsed, and for me at that point, I was 13 years old. So you can imagine what kind of traumatic experience it was for such a young boy. I have nightmares till this very day. And when I have my nightmares, one of them is looking at my father's partially composed face. I live with it, it lives within me. It was a very traumatic experience. In my book, I call it the turning point of my life. So anyway, eventually those victims, we have them to be bury them a proper burial. We took those 37, one of the managed to escape during the night, he pretended to be dead. But the 37 victims we took in casket to our cemetery to give them a proper burial and it took a long time to prepare a mass grave. We didn't have in those days those heavy air moving machinery as you are used to see today. It took a long time, people volunteered to prepare a mass grave. And I was standing next to my father's casket for many hours, talking to him, praying, crying, asking him a simple question. Daddy, why did they kill you? I didn't understand it. I didn't understand it at the age of 13, and believe you me, I don't understand it to the age, at the age of 87. Why did they murder my father? He didn't do anything wrong. I was devastated. What am I going to do? Where am I going to go? Who's going to take care of me? It was a terrible, terrible feeling. It is only after the war that the Polish government erected that monument. Ten have never been identified. My, my father is number 23. It is in the Hebrew language. And this is the official document that I received after the war from the Polish government that my father was murdered on 11 Brzeszyn, which means in Polish, September 1939. So obviously it was very, very difficult for me. I was so young. I was very despondent. I, I, I was just devastated. And then the Germans issued every day new orders to make our life miserable. And one of the very first orders was that I couldn't go to school anymore. My education ended at the age of 13. Would you like to know when I graduated from high school? I'll tell you. When I came to New York, I had no skills. To make a living, I cleaned toilets. But I wanted to improve myself. I went to Brooklyn College. I wanted to learn accounting. So they told me to be admitted to college. Where is the certificate from high school? So I didn't finish high school. I didn't even finish elementary school. So they said, sorry, you cannot be admitted to college. So the only option I had was to work daytime to make a living and to study by myself in the evening. I submitted a test to New York State, and when I passed that test, they gave me that piece of paper, which is called Equivalency High School Diploma. And with that piece of paper, I was admitted to Brooklyn College. I learned accounting, and that is how I made a living as an accountant until I retired at the age of 73. So I'm trying not to impress you. I know you don't like me. The accountant has to prepare tax returns, and you wouldn't like that. But what I can tell you is you have no idea how this has an impact on those young students. They realize it's much easier to graduate at the age of 18 when you have no responsibilities than to graduate at the age of 35. As you see, this was given to me in 1961. And having other responsibilities. So I'm very gratified because in those letters you'll be surprised how many students tell me I decided 
to go to college, I decided to go to high school, or I decided not to, not to quit, and get so many letters, and I'm very gratified. To give you one vivid example, the other day I went to a, buy a pair of sneakers in Hillsborough, <coughs> and this young lady, <coughs> excuse me, approached me, she said, may I help you? And I said, yes, please. Then she said, oh my God, I know who you are. You spoke in my school about a year ago. Oh. And then she said, you know something? My mother would like to hug you and kiss you. So I said, I'm ready. <laughs> but then she said, you don't know why. Who cares why? <laughs> I'll tell you why she said, when you came to my school, this was exactly the time when I considered to quit school. I was born this high school. But listening to your story, I realized how privileged I am. And I told my ma, I'm going to stay in school and work here part time. I was very gratified. Now don't ask me what happened between her mother and me, but this is an <laughs> argument. Again. But again, seriously, when I get those letters, many of them, and I realized that I did something good because I know how difficult life is if you don't have an education. And many of them take it very seriously. And that is one of the reasons that I am really making an effort to share my story. The second reason is that there are people who are ignorant about the Holocaust. The other day a teacher asked me to make him a copy how I looked after the liberation. So I went to Kinkos to make a copy. I didn't know how to operate a copier. I asked one of the young men to help me and looked at the picture and looked at me and he asked me, is this you? So here. Yeah. He said, you don't look like a criminal. So I'm not a criminal, I'm a Holocaust survivor. He had no idea what I was talking about. And he grew up in Portland. I was shocked. The third reason that I'm here is that there are people who deny the Holocaust. Mm -hmm. They say it didn't happen. Mm -hmm. Ahmadinejad, the president of Iran, he said in the United Nations, the Holocaust is a myth. How dare he say so? How does anybody dare to say there are still Holocaust survivors alive, not many, carrying their physical and mental scars? There are 27 the Holocaust museums just in the United States and they are all over the world. There are 11,000 books about the Holocaust. No other event in history has been seen so well documented as World War II. And then here people come in the United Nations and he, the same, the same Ahmadinejad tells 70 million Iranians that the Holocaust is a myth. It's so painful uh, to me as a Holocaust survivor or something telling me it didn't happen. So let me tell you something about my book. I had no intent to write a book. I didn't feel myself qualified to write a book or able to write a book. But I went to a church right here in Vancouver at the end of my presentation, an older gentleman approached me with tears in his eyes, and that's what he told me. I was an officer in the American Army in 1945. I was one of the liberators of Buchenwald, a very infamous camp in Germany. I remember what we saw in those camps. And he broke down and he told me, please promise me in front of the congregation that you are going to put your life story in print. Do it for my children and for my grandchildren. That is the only reason that I wrote that book. I have no financial interest in it. But he asked me, and that is the reason that I wrote that book. And the first copy, I went to the post office and I sent it to the president of Iran. And since then, I'm writing him letters once in a while, attaching documents that the Holocaust did happen. No other event in history had been so well documented, mainly because of the advent of photography and recording. And in my last letter, you know what I did? I made a copy of the check that I've been getting from Germany every month for the last 60 years. I made a copy of the check, attached it to my letter to the president of Iran, and I asked him, if there, is no, if there was no Holocaust, why do I get a check from Germany? Why don't you get a check from Germany? 
I mean, it doesn't make any sense. He never answered my letters. I hope, as of today, he's no more president, as you know, so maybe now he's going to have time to read it. <laughs> so I couldn't go to school. My little town became a ghetto, which means basically segregation. We couldn't live at the same time, just in a very limited area. I couldn't go to the schools I mentioned before. I had to bow my head before any passing by German. So many restrictions, but there was no mass murder as it developed later on 1941-42. But in the middle of the night, in May 1941, the German knocked at the door of my apartment and they took my older brother away. My stepmother, pleaded with them, but it didn't help. One year later, one year later, in June 1942, the middle of the night, the Germans knocked at the door. They looked at me, they didn't ask my age. They just told me the German language, you have a few minutes to get ready. My stepmother pleaded with the German. He's such a young boy. He's 15 years old. He needs a mother. Have mercy. Don't take him away from me. I love that boy. What did the Germans do? They slept on her face. You dare to question our action? They fell unconscious. They took me away. I never had a chance to say goodbye to my stepmother and to my younger brother. What did the Germans do with me? They put me into a wagon like that. I'm sure that some of you saw documentaries like Schindler's List or The Pianist. But picture yourself, and that is exactly how it was. I have no reason to exaggerate. I know it's going to be hard to believe. Eighty people were pushed into that car. Different ages. We were locked from the outside. Nothing to eat, nothing to drink for a day and a half. We were all standing all the time. There was no room where to sit down. One of us did die. He died standing like a pillar. There was no room where to fall. There are no words in the dictionary to describe the conditions in that hellish car. After a day and a half, I arrived to my first slave labor camp called Blechame in Germany. Upon arrival, I was beaten for no reason. But then something very unexpected happened to me. One of the prisoners in that camp recognized me from my hometown, told me, do you know that you brothers in this camp? I didn't know. So he took me to meet my brother. I didn't recognize my own brother. Not seeing him for one year, he aged 10 years like an old man. I just didn't recognize him. It's one of the most traumatic experiences in my life that I could not recognize my own brother. <coughs> Why did he deteriorate to such an extent that I couldn't recognize him? Just to give you an idea, the conditions in those camps, just an idea. 24 people were housed in a room, 8 by 10. 8 by 10 is about a quarter of this room. And there were three bunks or beds. The bunks had no mattresses, just straw infested with roaches and lice. They gave us two slices of bread in the morning, and the bread was made out mostly of sawdust. Sawdust. I know it wouldn't be edible to any person who has more or less a normal life. But we had no choice. Lunch, we never got lunch. And in the evening, coming back after a long day, <coughs> excuse me, after a long day of hard work, they give us a soup, very diluted. Lucky you were, you found a floating potato and other vegetable. So obviously people were dying constantly on starvation. According to my reading, 15 million people, including 4 million Russian prisoners of war, died on starvation in those camps. And to die on starvation 
is a very painful way to die from. I say it from my own experience. I suffered starvation. Why is it so painful? Because the body eats itself, and then it takes a long time, sometimes three or even four days, till you die. I personally witnessed not hundreds, thousands of people dying from starvation. So anyway, my older brother was very pleased that we are going to be together. Excuse me. But on the other hand, he was very concerned. How will I be able to undo those conditions that he already experienced for one year? At the very first day, marching to work, I learned something which is extremely important. And I appreciate that you are attentive, each and every one of you, because I do see your faces. But please remember that, what I want to tell you now. I had the impression that only me, because I happened to be a Jewish boy, that I was oppressed. But walk, marching to work, I saw so many different groups going to the same place, being oppressed to a certain extent to the white earth. What did, who were they? Jehovah Witnesses, homosexuals, Ukrainians, POWs, gypsies. Many 30, 40 different groups marching to the same place. What did I learn? Every Jew was a victim, but not every victim was a Jew. Please remember that. Every Jew was a victim, but not every victim was a Jew. It is my personal conviction. If Hitler would have won the war, you and you wouldn't be sitting here in a free society. Hitler had a plan. Heute Deutschland, morgen über alles. Today we are in Germany. Tomorrow we shall be everywhere. You don't have blue eyes and blonde hair. You are not a pure-blooded German. You are inferior. I am going to enslave you. And if I feel like, I am going to annihilate you. It is very well documented. It is very well documented. This was his plan. I just read recently, it is, they found a document that Hitler gave an order to the generals in August 1930. Nine, that all the Poles should be killed. 37 million. Because they are inferior. So we are all lucky that Hitler did not win the war. On the very first week in that camp, Blechamer, I had an experience which I would like to share with you. <coughs> it will give you an idea how bad things were. While I was working, a Pole approached me and he told me the Polish language, I see that you have a wristwatch. Give me your watch. I'll give you a loaf of bread. <coughs> I was very young, naive, hungry. I gave him the watch. I didn't give it a second thought. He never gave me a loaf of bread. I don't know how this evolved, but in the evening, coming back to our camp, there was a roll call. We all had to assemble of the, in the camp, at the center of the camp, and the commander said like that, today at the working place, one of you Heftlinger or inmates gave away his watch for a promised loaf of bread. And as you know, this is a crime. If that prisoner doesn't step forward and admit this crime, you are all going to be punished collectively. You'll be standing here the entire night and go to work tomorrow morning like any other day. As I mentioned at the beginning, I was brought up with certain values, and one of them was that I'm responsible for my own action. I did step forward, and that is what I said. I'm the one that gave away my watch for a promised loaf of bread because I'm so hungry. And I know that my brother is hungry too. So all the others, about 2,000, were dismissed to their barracks, and I was taken into a punishment room. 
There would be 15 strokes on my bare body. It was very painful, very painful. God's will, a miracle, I did survive. When I came out, my older brother was standing there thanking God that I was still alive. I committed a crime, giving away my watch for a promised loaf of bread. Just to give you an idea how things were in those camps. <coughs> I was in that camp only for four months, and then they decided to send me to another camp called Brande. By doing so, they separated me from my brother, and from that moment, I have never seen my brother again. After the war, he didn't show up. I assumed that he perished, like all the other 123 members of my extended family. I didn't know where or when, but something very dramatic happened to me in New York City some years ago. There was a gathering of Holocaust survivors in New York City, and somebody approached me, he said to me like that, you don't know me, I know you. I was the bookkeeper in your father's business, I remember you as a little child. I have to tell you something that you don't know. I, with my own hands, pushed your brother Samuel into the gas chamber in Auschwitz. This was his job. What the Germans did, they just turned on Cyclone B gas, and the people in those gas chambers choked to death. But all the other dirty work was done by other prisoners, and he knew my brother from home, so he told me that my older brother perished in Auschwitz. You see, this by itself is a very painful experience that we have to live with. Millions of victims never had a funeral. They have no graves. We don't have even an anniversary of their demise. When we had the other, on, on September 11, 2001, when we had that tragic event, watching television, seeing those World Trade Center towers collapsing, what came to my mind? Are those people consumed in that inferno? Are they going to have a funeral, a grave? Apparently over 2,000 have never been identified. This by itself is very painful for Holocaust survivors to live in. It reminds me, the other day I spoke in Concordia University and one of the students stands up and he says, Mr. Wiener, I know exactly what you mean because my brother drowned right here in Oregon and his body has never been recovered and my mother is miserable that she cannot visit her son's grave. So this is one of the <coughs> sad experiences that we have to live with. <coughs> so as I mentioned to you, I was sent to my second camp called Brande in Germany. Very tough winter, it was October 1942. The commander in that camp was such a sadist, he enjoyed torturing us. This was, he was a sadist. He took me once and, and some others, pushing us to enter a cold bathroom, forcing us to be standing underneath a cold shower. People were standing underneath a cold shower for the duration of the night. They were suffering and dying. And he was standing there and entertaining himself, watching us suffering. This is the concept that I mentioned before, Schadenfreude. You entertain yourself watching others suffering. I was in that camp only for two months, and then I was sent to my third camp. But I must share with you something interesting, which happened recently, and it is not mentioned in my book, because my book was published in 2007. One day I got a telephone call from Michigan University, and somebody introduced himself. I am a German professor teaching German literature in Michigan University. I have been living with a guilt feeling my entire life because my father was involved in Camp Brande. I have been looking for survivors. I found one in Australia and one in Canada. And now when I went to the internet, I see that you wrote a book from a name to a number. And in that book, you are mentioning that Camp Brande. And I'm calling you to ask you forgiveness. I told him right away, there's nothing for me to forgive you. You're not responsible for your father's action or inaction. 
We were on the phone for about half an hour. And I finally convinced him that I don't hate him because of his father. Action. So that is the way I feel. And I'm glad that I convinced him that I don't hate him. But it's a very interesting point because apparently from that particular camp, the very, very few survivors. He found only one in Australia and one in Canada, and I'm the third one that he could locate. So from that camp, I was sent to my third camp, called Gross Maslowitz, also in Germany. The conditions were very similar, same kind of shelter, food, beatings. In that camp, I was there for 15 months. There's one episode which happened to me in that camp, which is very, very interesting, very important, very dramatic. And again, I appreciate that you are so attentive. It's just a pleasure to talk to you. But this is something I would like you to listen carefully, think about it, come home, analyze it. Especially you are all religious people, maybe you'll find the answer to this phenomena or this episode that I'm going to share with you. In that camp, <clears throat> at one point, I worked in a factory together with German employees, mostly women because men were drafted to the army. The German women worked in that part of the factory, operating textile machinery, and we prisoners worked in that part of the factory dismantling old machinery and putting up new machinery for the production of ammunition. <clears throat> and there were signs all over the factory, a huge factory, maybe 10 times as big as this room, in the German language addressed to the German employees. <clears throat> don't give anything to the prisoners, don't talk to them, don't make even eye contact with them, and if you do, you are doomed. One day, while I was sitting there and dismantling a machine, a middle-aged German woman, on the way to the restroom, from here to here, did make eye contact with me. And she hinted to me like that with her finger. I had no idea what she meant. I had a feeling it must be something important. But I had to watch myself that nobody should notice me approaching that indicated spot. Eventually, I did find the right moment, and what happened? I found a sandwich of two slices of white bread with a slice of cheese underneath a crate. That German woman repeated that noble act of leaving a sandwich for me every day, for 30 days, as long as I worked at that location. She risked her life for me, not once, 30 times. Every day when she put a sandwich over there, she risked her life. That's exactly what the sign said. She would be executed instantly. I don't know to what extent it helped me to survive. This was only for 30 days out of 1,050 days that I was incarcerated. <coughs> Excuse me. But the question is, why? What motivated her? She was a German woman. She, read on the, she heard on the radio and she read in the paper every day that I am an Untermensch, subhuman. And she is the master race, superior. Why was she willing to risk her life for a young Jewish boy? Why? What comes to your mind? Think about it. When you come home, try to analyze it. I'll tell you what comes to my mind. <clears throat> Maybe she was a very religious person, like you are, and she felt that she has to help somebody in need. Maybe she had a son at my age and felt sorry for me. Maybe she wanted to make a point that not all the Germans were so cruel. I don't know. I never will. <clears throat> but I'm so grateful. This German woman is my heroine to the last day of my life. 
not only because of the practical help of leaving sandwiches for me, but she taught me a very important lesson, and I'll tell you why. Three weeks prior to that, a German guard, for no good reason, <coughs> punched me and knocked out many of my teeth. I have no teeth. He was a German, and she was a German. They were both German nationals. Well, look at the difference. One was wicked, and the other one was a righteous person. What did they learn? That you are going to find good people and bad people in every group. That prejudice or stereotyping is absurd. Voltaire, the 18th century French philosopher, said, those who can make you believe absurdities can make you commit atrocities. I am so grateful. She is my heroine to the last day of my life because she taught me a very important lesson. She was willing to risk her life for me 30 times, despite the fact that she was indoctrinated to hate me. I can just tell you that after the war, as soon as I regained some strength, I went to look for her, to thank her, all I remembered was the location where this happened. And I went to that location. I went to City Hall, pleading with them, help me to locate a woman that in 1943 risked her life for me 30 times. What's her name? What's her address? I didn't know. They looked at me to be insane. How can you locate anybody if you don't have a name or her address? But logic, logic didn't play a role. I just felt the need to thank her for her righteous deed. And she is my heroine to the last day of my life. You'll be surprised how many letters I'm getting from students. They tell me, Mr. Wiener, I promise you that my entire life I'll try to be like that German woman who gave you the sandwich. The other day I spoke in a prison. I go to prisons quite often, not because of crime I committed. <laughs> I just talk to those prisoners. And sometimes I'm talking to lifers, those who have been sentenced for life. And this happened to me right here, not far from here, in Woodburn. There's a, it's called McLaren High School. And there's a unit of 40 young men who have been sentenced for life. They're all murderers. And at the end of my presentation, I gave them a chance to express their feelings or what they think about my presentation, to what extent it impressed them, or what did they learn from. You know what one of them told me? Today, you gave me a sandwich. So you get the understanding, the impact it has on that story. They just realize that you can be good and not to murder somebody. You can save somebody's life. From that camp, by the way, talking about the impact that my presentation has, I don't know if many of you probably remember Kip Kinkler, the one who killed his parents and two students. I was sitting with him in church. I mean, in the jail, just watching him having lunch. I didn't ask, talk to him about his crime, but he wrote me a letter later on that I changed his life. Mm -hmm. How? I mean, he had no chance for parole, but how did I change his life? Because he realized how humanely he's treated in that jail, even though that he committed a terrible crime. And I explained to him, you have visitors, I didn't have visitors. You are not being beaten every day the way I was beaten. It's against the law to beat you. Your life is not in danger. I can, and you get medical care, which I didn't. I could go on and on and on. So they just realize, even in that situation, and under those circumstances, how lucky they are how privileged they are to live in such a free society. So from that camp, I was sent to my fourth camp, Klettendorf, 
also in Germany. At that time, it was 1944, the Germans started to lose the war. My job was digging trenches. One day, I was digging a trench, and I came across a raw potato. A farmer left the potato in the field. I picked it up and ate, raw, dirty, unpeeled. A new arrival from Belgium, from Holland, Belgium, that one lady here is from, observed me eating a raw potato, said to me, how in the world can you eat a raw potato? How can you take this humiliation, starvation? I just came from Belgium. I had a wife, a child, good business, good, good parents. I'm not going to take it. And I tried to reason with him. If you'd have the experience of two and a half years camp life the way I, I had, you'd be lucky to find a raw potato. It tasted better than to eat peels of a potato. Like I used to go to the garbage can to, be, to, to, to look for a peel of a potato. I used to eat snow to survive. You have no idea what starvation means. You might be hungry once in a while. But if you are starving, you will eat anything that you put your hands on. And he really didn't last long. And from that camp, I was sent to my fifth camp. This was my last camp, a real concentration camp called Waldenburg. Very isolated area. If I tell you, that I did not see a woman or a child for eight months. I didn't see a flower or a meadow for eight months. I didn't see my own face for eight months because there were no mirrors in that camp. I know it is hard to believe. It's hard to, how could people survive out of those circumstances? We got up in the morning, we didn't have a towel, a toothbrush, a toothpaste. How did we survive? I had hands the way you have hands. I couldn't touch anybody. Nobody touched me. The most basic human instinct couldn't be exercised. I had ears the way you have ears. I couldn't listen to the sound of music. All I could hear was ye people yelling at me, shouting at me, cursing me and telling me that I'm no good. On what basis, I'll never understand. I had eyes the way you have eyes. I couldn't read, there was nothing to read. And since there was nothing to read, and we had no radio, we had no idea what was going on in the world. So on May the 9th, 1945, we assembled to go to work like any other day. But the German guards that ordinarily escorted us to our working place didn't show up. We wondered why. About one o'clock, a tank of the Russian army approached our gate, and the officer said, you are liberated. At that point, we realized that the Germans were defeated. When the Russian soldiers saw our emaciated bodies, they cried like babies. They told us, you can go out to the city of Baldenburg, kill Germans. We are giving you three days of freedom. Take revenge. We know how you feel, because we lost 22 million of our own people. I didn't go out to kill, it's not ingrained in me. I was brought up in, a, in a, my, father, my father's slogan was hate hatred and shun violence. And besides, I could hardly walk, I was so weak. I was standing, I was staying in that camp. I had no place where to go. I had no strength to do anything. But the German family who lived in that vicinity they came to our camp either out of compassion or out of fear that we are going to take revenge. And one of them offered me to stay in her house until I re regained some strength. And that is what I did. I did stay in her house for a while. And then eventually I went back to Poland to see if somebody of my family survived. This was the only way to find out. We had no computers. Even with the Red Cross couldn't provide you with reliable information. So I did stay in Poland for a few weeks, and only four cousins of mine did show up, and 123 members of my extended family, they were all murdered. This is very, very briefly my If you remember, at the beginning, I mentioned that under Hitler, Every Jew is a victim, but not every victim, but a Jew. This woman, as you see, they are, 
they're checking the, the distance between the eyes and and the, and, the, and the forehead and the color of the skin, the color of the eyes and the color of the hair to be sure that she's a pure, pure German blooded German. Does this make sense to you to determine somebody's ability or character based on the color of the eyes, hair, or skin? Does this make sense to you? If you have an open mind, you'll come to the same conclusion that I came a long, long time. We are all God's children period, and there's nothing to do the color of the skin or the color of the hair. It is your character and your ability. But this is Hitler's ideology. You see, this picture you saw at the beginning, and the other one I took a few months later, I just put on my jacket as a souvenir. But you can see the difference. I gained 40 pounds from 80 to 120. You see, the first picture, girls paid no attention to me, but here they changed their mind. Oh. <laughs> I'm just telling you the truth. Oh. I've, mentioned, I've mentioned before, I got an honorary, an honorary bachelor degree by Honor Pacific College. I was very humbled. And I told the audience, this was a commencement. They all became PhDs, and they gave me a standing ovation. And I told them how humbled I am. And I told them that being in camps, I had two dreams. One dream was that one day I should be able to eat as much bread as I want and sleep on a mattress. Thank God this materialized in this blessed country. The other dream was to be reunited with my family. Unfortunately, did not materialize. But I never dreamt. I never dreamt that one day I'm going to be in the United States talking to such a distinguished audience at this event or talking to you. I never dreamt this was going to happen to me in my life. So Professor Barber, the president of the college, came to the podium and he said, Mr. Wiener, I promise you that we PhDs can learn from your experience more than you can learn from all of us. I hope by the same token that you too learned something from me today. If you recall, I gave you the three reasons why I'm sharing my story. It is not easy, physically, mentally. And one of them was people deny the Holocaust. This picture was taken by an American soldier. These are shoes taken away from those victims before they were pushed into the gas chamber. These are shoes of children. Every day when I take a shower and I look at the shower head, I, took, I talk to myself, what went through in the mind of my little brother? At the age of 10, he was sent to Auschwitz, together with his mother, on, April, on February 18, 1943. He was pushed into a gas chamber. He lived over there for a few minutes. Instead, worked that Cyclone B gets choked into death. How much did that little boy suffer? And why? Who had the heart to murder a million and a half children under the age of 14 were murdered? Why? This is not a fake. I sent this picture to the president of Iran. General Eisenhower gave an order to the American soldiers, to those who liberated the camp, take pictures. Because one day somebody might say it didn't happen. Unfortunately, there are people who say it didn't happen. What did Eisenhower, Bradley, and Patton found in those camps? You can see dead bodies. Those who were still working were half dead. This is not a fake. This is real. The Nuremberg trial that lasted for 10 months from, from November 1945 to October 1946. Those 24 German officials and military commanders, they didn't deny that they gave orders to commit those terrible atrocities. All what they did say to their defense was, well, we had to follow Hitler's orders, but they don't deny the Holocaust. So people have the audacity to deny. In Babi Yar, in the Ukraine, this picture was taken by a German soldier while he committed those terrible crimes. Hundreds of thousands of people in the Ukraine and Russia were forced to dig their own graves. They were shot with one bullet in the neck, and then they were buried half alive. There is now a priest in France, I don't know if you read it in the paper the way I did, by the name of Patrick 
de Bois that he dedicates his life to find mass graves in the Ukraine and Russia, and so far he located 860 mass graves. This is not a fake. This was taken by a German soldier. So people have the audacity to say it didn't happen. This picture was taken by a British soldier in Bergen-Belsen. That is what they found in Bergen-Belsen. Thousands and thousands and thousands of dead bodies. This man in the middle is my schoolmate. This picture was taken by an American soldier. He died one day after the war. Thousands of Holocaust survivors died soon after the war because they couldn't digest the normal food or the good food given to them by the Americans, the British and the French. Unfortunately, the, the Americans didn't realize that you cannot give a hamburger to somebody who had been deprived for years of basic nutrients. This is a very, very tragic phenomenon, but that's what happened. And the main reason is because in those days, in the medical schools, they didn't teach nutrition. And one of the reasons that they do teach nutrition today is because of that experience. <coughs> would you mind to read it in unison? I would like to hear it. Go ahead. Well, I don't know if you heard about this clergyman, the German, who wrote this after the war, a few months after the war, when he realized that the world was at fault by not protesting or doing something about the Holocaust. So this is basically the idea. If you see injustice or unfairness, speak up, do, do, do something about it. Otherwise, it's going to affect you in your own life. This was his message. <coughs> this young girl, it's not my date, it's a, <laughs> she's a German exchange student. She, they, she came to the United States for a year and she came to interview me. At the door she told me, you probably hate me. And I told her right away, why should I hate you? Well, my, great -grand my grandfather was a Nazi and we in the family know that he did terrible things. So I told her, well, but is this your fault? You are not responsible for your grandfather. And we became friends. And in fact, her parents came not a long time ago to visit the United States and they came to see me. And her father asked me, do you hate me? I asked him, when were you born? Well, he said, 1950. So if you are born five years after the war, I don't see any reason for me to hate you. You have to judge each individual on his own merits. That is my understanding. And we became friends. So, I went to a school in Getson High School. At the end of my presentation, a young student approached me. She said to me, I heard you, but I didn't see you. Initially, I didn't understand what she meant, but the principal who was sitting next to me whispered in my ear, that student is legally blind. She did not see you, she just heard you. But then I got an email from her. I don't know how she functions in the school, but in the email she tells me, Mr. Wiener, you changed my life. I'm a Muslim girl. I was very prejudiced, but not anymore. You changed my life. Why? Because in my presentation, I mentioned that under Hitler, any baby that was born with any kind of disability or handicap was murdered by the doctors and the nurses. Hitler gave an order to all the hospitals if a baby is born with any kind of a health problems, kill it. 250,000 German babies were murdered by the doctors and by the nurses. So when she heard that, she realized if she would be born in Germany with impaired vision, she would be 
murdered as an infant. So they decided to have a play in the school based on my life story. And here she is playing a role. You can see that she has a vision problem that based on my life story, she appreciates the fact that I shared my life story with them. So this is very, very briefly my life story and I'm going to share with you Uh, if, if you have any questions for me, I'm open to elder questions, but on the, I would like to end with my message of hope. Never give up hope. At one point in 1945, in February 1945, I was so weak, I couldn't work anymore. And the way the system works, if you cannot work, you cannot be utilized, they kill you. So there was no crematorium in that camp. Waldenburg, so they sent me to a killing center. And I was standing in line to be killed. I saw the chimney. I could smell the, the, offensive, order, the offensive order of burning flesh. I was so scared. And all of a sudden, while I was standing in line, a German entrepreneur approached me and he shouted at me in the German language, Come on, Rausknabe, du kannst doch bei der Arbeit kapieren. Get out of that line, young boy, you can still work. And he sent me back to work. And a few weeks later, I was free. God's will, you never know. Never give up hope. And that is why I always tell the young students, you never know what's going to be tomorrow. And on a lighter note, if I may share with you, the other day I went to a high school, and a student asked me, how old are you? He said, I'm giving, I gave him my age. He said, how come you live so long, you suffered so much? I don't know, God knows. I can just tell you my lifestyle. I don't drink alcohol, I don't smoke, I don't take drugs, I'm a vegetarian, like most of you are. This might have something to do with my longevity. Are you telling me that you have no vices? <laughs> vices? Okay, I do have two vices. I like chocolate and women. <laughs> so he said, me too. <laughs> but that's not the end of the story. The following year, I was invited to the same school. And the young female teacher presented me with a bar of chocolate. And she said to me, I remember from last year, your two vices. I can satisfy you with one vice only. <laughs> but if you come next year, we shall see. <laughs> There's always hope. <laughs> By the way, of the same, of the same note, talking about my book, as I say, you don't have to buy it, you can get it in any library. But apparently it's a good book. If you go to Amazon, you'll see today it is rated number 59 out of 41 million books. Wow. And the other day, if I may share it, because it happened in a Mormon church, so they would accept it. I went to Albany to a Mormon church, and one of the ladies stands up, there are about 1,000 people, a few more than here, <laughs> and she stands up and she says, Mr. Wiener, I took you to bed for two nights. You took me to bed for two nights? <laughs> I don't remember even one night, if my, if my memory is so deficient. Mr. Wiener, I went to bed with your book, not with your book. Okay. Uh, by the way, there's somebody in our audience. Um, would you like to introduce your friend who's, who came today? Phil Mandel. <coughs> Phil, Phil Mandel, Phil Mandel is uh, willing to take over once I'm gone, and he's also going to make a movie based on my life story. So I appreciate that he was permitted to come in here. He's already in touch with Steven Spielberg's staff, and so it's... it's uh, and if he, if, it, like if, he, if he does, going to make a movie, he's promising me that he's going to send a complimentary ticket to each and every one of you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to say anything? Would you go one more click on your, go one more click? Oh yeah, I forgot. Someone asked me earlier what the timeline 
on the movie project is? And I gave an honest answer. As soon as we have the first $150,000, we can hire a screenwriter and make a trailer. And then we'll have something that we can approach Spielberg and other producers with. And from that point, I would say two to three years. So as soon as you all get me $150,000 check, we'll get the ball rolling. <laughs> you see, because of his plan, because of his plan, I have to live another few years because I would like to play a role because all the other movies that you saw, it's not the actual survivors, it is actors, the Schindler's List or the Pianist, even though in the Pianist, if you saw the Pianist, if you didn't, you should, great yeah, great movie, he could have played because he survived and later on he became a conductor. He, he survived, but he, apparently he did not play a role. I, if I'm alive, I would like to play the role because our agreement, our, le our legal agreement is that nothing should be changed. It should be authentic to my book, and my book is authentic to my experience. No fiction. Just that's the way how it was. And I, again, I hope that you read my book, and you're going to like it, and if you like it, Write a book review on Amazon.com for the future generations. And take me, the ladies of you, if you do buy the book, please take me to bed. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm, we, we really have no time for questions, but we're going to do it because it's such a special event. Yes, it is. So, um, question, Bonnie. I would like to know, did you ever find out Did she's asking, did you ever marry and so on? I didn't get married, my wife got married. <laughs> yes, I did marry. I have been married for many, many years. Unfortunately, my wife has been in a nursing home for many years in Parkinson. And I have two sons and six grandchildren. I cannot compete with my great grandfather because if you read the book, you'll see that he had 28 children. Two wives, one died, died after 14, and then he had another 14 children. And when I used to, when I was a young boy, he used to tell me, you better keep that tradition. <laughs> but apparently I didn't do a good job, I wanted to. <laughs> yes? Um, uh, how, how did um, your experience um, change or, or shape your view of God? How did your experience shape or change your view of God? I didn't change. I said in my book, I have questions that I don't understand. Like Paul Paul Jam the second, he went to Auschwitz and he said, God, how could you have kept silent? I had a lot of questions, but what I can say to you is, I was brought up in a very religious home. Even though I, they took away my prayer book, I continued to pray because I remembered most of the prayers by heart. I prayed on the way to work, at work. I constantly prayed. And I, I and apparently, God came to my rescue. But the questions I had, I saw people are being murdered. I had questions, why, what did I do wrong that I deserve to be so mistreated? I had a lot of questions, but I never gave up my faith. And in my, in my, my, one of the slogans, or one of the quotes in my book, you'll see is, hope and faith go together. Amen. Gary. It's a very good question, and I did hear you. I, don't, I have a difficulty, that's it, I need help. Well, don't feel bad, I do too, but <laughs> I have a, first, she can confirm that. There, there's a big difference between those who are liberated by the Russians and those who are liberated by the other allies, the British, the English, and the French. What did the Americans do? General Eisenhower gave an order. The first thing, when you liberate those camps, Establish those DP camps, displaced person camps. Anybody who was a prisoner could walk into those camps and be helped, be fed, be sheltered. What did the Russian told us? What did they say to us? You are free, but you are on your own. So in other words, they were not equipped, not because of ill will. They just were not equipped to help us. 
So I was on my own, and if you do read my book, you'll see I had a very difficult time after the war. There were days that I was hungry after the war. I was homeless. I was in a refugee camp for more than a year. Because the Russians were not equipped to help us, so I had a very, very tough time. I'm getting quite often telephone calls or emails from World War II veterans who tell me, well, I read your book, I just realized that the Holocaust didn't end for you with the end of the war. I thought, as an American soldier, once you were liberated, that's it. But that's not my case. I had a very, very tough time. And something else which I have to tell you, because it's a very important question. The Holocaust lives within me. I don't live with it. I will die with it. It's not something I can part from it. I can go to a wedding or to a party and be jovial, and all of a sudden my face changes, and people who know me ask me, what's wrong with you, you don't feel good? I'm getting flashbacks. And the worst part of it is my nightmares. You have no idea how this bothers me. I sometimes I, w I wake up, I'm sweating, and I'm glad that I'm not there, that I'm in the real world. It is, it is a problem. And probably, you know, John McCain said it once in a very good word. If you are, when he was running for presidency, when you are tortured once, and he was tortured for five and a half years in Vietnam, if you are tortured once, you are tortured for the rest of your life. I am trying to function as a normal person, but I am not pretending to be a normal person. It reminds me because this happened right here in the library in Vancouver. I spoke in several libraries in Vancouver. And in one of them, I think it was two years ago, at the end of my presentation, a young man approached me. He said to me, I know what you mean when you say you are not normal. I am not normal either. And I looked at him and I wondered why did he say that? He looked to me, a young, healthy person. Well, I came back from Iraq and I lost my right leg over there. They fixed me with an artificial leg. When I walk, people that don't know me, they assume that I'm normal. But when I come home to go to sleep or to go to take a shower, I take my artificial leg, put it aside, and realizing that I'm norm not normal, never will be. Same here, I take a shower, I see the, the physical scars that are still there, you see. It is in me, the Holocaust lives within me. Terry? What was the reason for moving you from camp to camp? What was the reason for moving you from camp to camp? It's a very good question. I have to explain you how the system works. Every able German was taken to the army. To run the economy, you need manpower. So they took all those men from, from those countries that they occupied, and they used them for that purpose. Wherever the need was greater, that is the reason that they shift people from one place to the other. Let's say, for example, a, a manufacturer of ammunition needed manpower. But they didn't have Germans, so they called up the German authorities and they sent them slaves. And that is how it is. I was in five different camps. I have a friend that he was only in one camp during the war, and I have somebody that he was in ten different camps. Mm -hmm. But basically, to your question, that is, that is the way how the system works. Now, besides this, I would like to make a point. You have to remember that the very, very young, and the elderly, like my brother at the age of 10, he didn't fit for work. They were sent not to, not to concentration camps or labor camps. They were sent directly to killing center. Mm -hmm. My little brother at the age of 10, he was probably killed on the way of arrival to Auschwitz. That is the way it worked. I was, basically, they took all the young boys to the, the, under the age of 14, mm -hmm or under the age of 16, they sent them directly to be killed. But when they came to pick me up, they didn't ask my age. I looked tall enough, they assumed that I am under that age, and they sent me to labor camp. Otherwise, they would have sent me directly to be killed. Matt? Uh, how were you able to keep track of time? 
Very good question. We did not. <laughs> Especially holidays, we had no idea. There were some people who had it in their head, but you have to remember, they took away from me everything. In the last camp, I didn't mention that before. When I arrived in, in Waldenburg, they stripped us naked. Everything was taken away from me. I don't even have a birth certificate. They took it away from me till this very day. And they gave us a uniform consisting on a jacket, trousers, no underwear, a coat, and a number, 64735. This was given to me in that camp. But otherwise, it was very, very difficult. You don't have a newspaper, you don't have a radio. You don't know, but all we, had, we did know, for example, on Sunday, most of the Sundays, we didn't go to work. But they, they enslaved us in camp, but we didn't go out to work, so I, we assumed it must be. But it was very difficult. I had no watch, I have no, it, it, I know it's very, un, those uniforms that I was given in camp in Wallenburg had no pockets. Mm. I owned nothing. The only possession that I had was the bowl for the soup mm. and the spoon. Nothing else, mm. nothing else. I know it's hard to believe, but that's the way it is. Again, I have no reason to exaggerate. I don't try to impress anybody. Even the young ladies among you, I cannot impress anymore. I'm too old. <laughs> Jeff. Today out here, the political left and political right accuse the other of taking us, if left unstopped, down the road of Nazism and socialism. And I always feel it's a misuse of the story of, of history. What's your perspective on how the political left and right use or misuse the story of Nazism today? I'll answer you maybe in a different way. The same question I was asked on KTU. I was interviewed on the television for about 15 minutes a few months ago. And the question was, when you see what's going on in the world today, what do you feel about it? So I told them that I was, when I was liberated, I thought that all the prejudice and wars and hatred will disappear, that they will learn something from the Holocaust. And on, on, on the other the TV station, I was interviewed, they, there was also a lady from Rwanda. And I told them that I'm very disappointed because I thought there's going to be no more Holocaust, and since then there was a Holocaust in Biafra, in Rwanda, in Kosovo, and so on and so on, and still going on. It troubles me. I'm very concerned, and I'm very disappointed. Did I answer your question? But it's, uh, your question was more, more philosophical. We need to use the story of history correctly without over, over stereotyping the enemy the political enemy. And does it ever bother you that you ever feel like we are misusing the story of Nazism just for political points? I'm against any stereotyping in general. You are going to find good people and bad people in every group. The best evidence like this German woman risk her life for a young Jewish boy. This is my philosophy. And this was when this young German student came to interview me, and she assumed that I hate her. And I told her, how can I hate you when an other German, the same nationality, risked her life for me? I mean, it, to me, it doesn't make sense. The entire concept of prejudice and stereotyping, to me, of, based on my empirical life, my life experience, it doesn't make sense. You are going to find good people and bad people, talented people and not so talented people in every group. I'll give you a very good, a vivid example, which I had in, in a university. A student stands up and he says, Mr. Wiener, you keep saying that Hitler considered you to be inferior. Wasn't Albert Einstein a Jew? So yeah, Albert Einstein happened to be a Jew. He was not a genius because he was a Jew. He just happened to be a Jew, and he just happened to be a genius. But he definitely was not inferior. The more you think about it, you realize it is absolutely senseless. You know, Jonas Salk, the one who invented vaccination against polio, he saved, according to my reading, 700 million lives. Do you hear me? 700 million lives. According to Hitler's definition, Jonas Salk 
is inferior because he happened to be a Jewish person. Does this make sense? All or I can tell you based on my, I paid a very high price for my philosophy and for my behavior. We are all God's children. Let us live in freedom. And here in the United States, maybe I am going to apply it more to your direct question. We have to be so grateful for the freedom that we have. Freedom of expression. There's a book written by an American, not by a Holocaust survivor, not by a Jewish person, an American professor. The name of the book is The Third Reich at War. And he is documenting in that book a German soldier wrote a letter to his wife. How are you, darling? How are the kids? I don't think that we are going to win the war. Just one sentence. For this one sentence, I don't think that we are going to win the war. He was executed. Because the censor in the army read that book. And he was called into the general and he says, you are demoralizing the German army. The point here is freedom of expression. I can go out here now and say I hate Obama, I hate Bush. Nothing is going to happen to me. You could do it in Germany, you'll be shot. You go to Iran today, not yesterday, and say I hate, I hate Ahmadinejad, you'll be arrested. Freedom of expression is so precious. I hope that we, I hope that I answered your question. If I'm the only survivor, there are not many left. When I came to Portland, there are about 50, and today we are about 10 left. I'm just here, I just mentioned to one of the ladies, because I have no time to die. <laughs> I'm, so, I'm so busy talking that I have no time to die. So. Judith? You have to bear with me for a while. Yeah, I was thinking, uh, listening to your story, you talked about starvation poor nutrition or no nutrition. And I was just wondering, when you started to be nourished, did you suffer any ill effects physiologically? Well, I have to tell you something. This is a very good question, interesting question. I was a very sickly young man after the war. For even when I got married, I couldn't understand why that black girl wanted to marry such a sick young man. All her friends discouraged her to marry me. I had, my main problem was I couldn't digest anything. Whatever I ate, I gave it back. <clears throat> but then I was lucky that I had a very good friend, the best friend of me in New York, who was a Seventh-day Adventist. Mm -hmm. We were very close. He happened to be an African-American originally from Honduras. And I went to his church many times, and I became aware that most of the people were vegetarians. At the same time, I worked in a factory where one of the peasants, before that, I mean, before that, in Israel, one of the people over there was a vegetarian. And his entire family, everybody died on cancer. So when he was a young student, he decided to do something about this, and he became a vegetarian or a vegan. And he told me once, I feel so sorry for you. You're such a young man, good-looking man, and you suffer so much. Try my way of life. And I did adapt his system, and then I met this man in New York. And eventually, in 1967, I became a strict vegetarian. And what can I tell you? I had so many, I know, I don't want to influence anybody who's not a vegetarian. And if there's anybody of you who's not a vegetarian, go home and enjoy your steak. That's not my, <laughs> not my. But I feel, if you ask me this question, I feel an obligation to tell you the truth. And I just spoke the other day to a group of vegetarians or vegans in Portland. Mm -hmm. They were very interested in that. And I wonder how most people don't realize that they can get help by changing their diet. Mm -hmm. I know for sure, if I wouldn't be a vegetarian, I wouldn't be here today. I had so many health problems. And if you do read my book, I hope you do, Again, you don't have to buy it, it's available in all the libraries. But they tell me it's a good book, and there's an entire chapter of that topic that you brought up. 
I was such a sick a young man. And comparison today, I suffered, you know, it's mentioned in my book. When I was liberated, I had a lot of arthritis in my entire, entire body. And when I was in Austria in a, in a refugee camp, the doctor wanted to operate me on my spine because I couldn't lie down. It was so painful. And somehow I had that intuition to object. And I say, no. If, I would, if he would have operated near my spine, I would probably be a, a cripple for the rest of my life. I can just tell you that I'm so convinced that to be a vegetarian, in my case, it helped me to survive. And uh, again, as I said, I used to go to that Adventist church quite often. He was a very good friend of mine, and I met many people who were vegetarian or vegans. And uh, I'll tell you something else. That they, I went to a convention of vegetarians in St. Louis, Missouri, some years ago. And I, all those people who came to that convention, they were strict vegetarians. And I met over there families. And I, there's one family I'll never forget, a mother, a husband, and three children. The children looked so beautiful, so healthy, and they never experienced any of the common diseases or sicknesses that children have. And they never tasted a hamburger or a frankfurter from the day they were born. In fact, they are even extreme. They, she hardly cooks. She says, instead to spend time in the kitchen, I go to a theater or to a movie or to read a book. Just, they just eat things that they are in nature. So if you are one of them, you're probably going to live to the age of 120. What did you say? He said, even if you weren't a vegetarian, we'd count you as a brother. <laughs> thank you, thank you. You don't know how much it means to me, because the, the German considered me to be untermensch, subhuman. You know, when I decided to write that book, finally, because that... When I decided to write that book, because that World War II veteran asked me, and I promised him, and I was thinking about a title, the first thing that came to my mind, when I was taking away my name, and they just gave me a number, it was so dehumanizing. Mm -hmm. And that is the reason that the name of my book, From a Name to a Number. Mm -hmm. And now people tell me, write another book, From a Number to a Name. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm too old. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank we you. really appreciate having you.